Looks like I know we've got uh, a lot of people maybe traveling this uh, Thanksgiving week, and uh, of course school's out all week, so my to-do list got this much longer, and uh, just kind of foreshadowing, I will get nothing, none of it done, but that's okay. Uh, this is a time of celebration and, and thanks, and so we need to take some time. I highly encourage you just to stop. Just stop life in general and just spend some quality time with your family. Boy, we, we just don't get to do that enough, do we? Uh, just to be with one another, enjoy one another, um, you know, just spend some quality time. So that's, that's precious. Hopefully each and every one of you get to do that this week. Well, I got some bad news for you. Okay, I know I shouldn't start off the lesson by giving bad news, but, you know, we talked about the fact that Christ calls us his sheep, well, I checked this week and we still are. We're still sheep. If you were coming back, hopefully, thinking that I was going to make this big revelation that we are in fact some better creature, that we were a predator of some sort, that we were a lion or tiger or bear, oh my, nope, we're still sheep. Okay? But they're re rejoice in that. And we're going to explore that this morning. I, I can thoroughly stand here and tell you, rejoice when Christ calls us his sheep. And we're going we're gonna to look at that in why. What would happen? I'm going to ask you a theoretical question. And I want you to think about your personal experiences as well. But what would happen if I walked into a congregation, and I'm not saying any particular congregation, but what if I walked into a congregation of Christ's church that I was not known, and the first person I saw, I walked up to and says, good morning, did you know you're a sheep? What would their reaction be? What would they say? What would they do? See, I personally think that they would take offense. Even if I said it in, in the most pleasant way. By the way, did you know? You're a sheep. And I'm a sheep too. I'm not sure what type of reception I would get. I know what reception I would get if I just went up to a stranger on the street if I said that. Hey, did you know you're a sheep? What would that reaction be? I can tell you it wouldn't be positive, would it? And that's the negative connotation that goes with that. So what do we do with that when Christ calls us his sheep? What do we do with that even though the world tells us that's a negative thing? We're supposed to rejoice in it and that's what we're looking at. Why are we referred to as the Lord's sheep and, and what's the overall picture of that? Just to review just a little bit, in case you missed it last week, we were talking about we established that over and over again that we are referred to as sheep in the Bible. In fact, the Bible makes reference to sheep over 200 times. It's the most referenced animal there is in the Lord's Word. Okay, several out of Psalm, out of Ezekiel, you'll see there, uh, we are referred to as sheep going to the pastures. And then we talked about some of the characteristics that we don't like that are attached to those sheep, especially when the metaphor used includes us, right? When we are compared to sheep, we do not like these characteristics. Followers, directionless and restless. Remember the story I told you about in India? 1,500 sheep just go off a cliff. 400 of them perish unclean remember the lanolin in their skins it's like velcro it picks up every single piece of dirt everything dirty imaginable in this world will stick to those sheep and they're heavily burdened defenseless we don't like that do we we don't like that at all and we talked about that sheep will settle to drink out of a muddy pool of water when clean flowing water is just steps away they'll settle for less. Kind of hits home, doesn't it? Kind of makes us want to think, oh, do I really, do I really want to be considered a sheep, even if it's Christ's sheep? All of those negative attributes. But then we discuss that's our pride talking. The world says, in a world full of sheep, be a lion, right? Be something that's a predator, that's strong, independent, we talked about that this morning in class. You know what the new religion is in this world today? The religion of yourself. 
right? You do you. It's all about me, me, me. That's why we have so many problems in our society today. We put ourselves first. It's a religion of self. And I never really thought about that uh, until I started doing these studies. And it, and it was awesome that it was mentioned in class this morning. We realize, as our humility will allow us, that if we truly are sheep, then we can't take care of ourselves. We'll perish. We need a shepherd. We need somebody to take care of us. God talks in Ezekiel in other places about what has happened to his sheep. And I believe if you read that verse, we have become prey. We have become food for all the wild beasts. Is this not happening in our society today? Because we don't have leadership. We don't have the shepherd that takes care of us. And of course, this was happening in the Bible, in the Old Testament, to God's people. And so part of that definition of God is love. God identified the problem, and then God will work for the solution. And the solution is we don't need to become lions. We're not capable of becoming lions. We're still sheep. We're still sheep. What we need is a shepherd. We need the good shepherd, as defined by John chapter 10, Jesus Christ. Coming down here, taking the lowest of the low, the job that nobody wants, being a shepherd to those dirty, burdensome sheep. He took it, and he took it gladly, and he went to the cross for us. And then we finished up talking about in a world full of sheep, don't be a goat. On the day of judgment in Matthew, Jesus says he will put the sheep on the right and the goats on the left. The sheep will enter in through him. He is the gatekeeper. They will enter into paradise, eternal life with him in heaven. Whereas the goats, they're left behind. Don't be left behind. And that's kind of where we left off last week. This morning, we're going to explore this metaphor a little bit further. We're going to look at some more characteristics, some more similarities between sheep and man. Why would Christ refer to us like that so many times? We're going to look at that in a positive light maybe this morning and then we'll have a little spin on that I want to go right into Luke because one of the things that we didn't talk about last week that we need to address is especially in biblical times one of the reasons why Jesus uses that metaphor is that sheep were extremely valuable to the people in the New Testament and the Old Testament living in those times sheep were a source not only for their wool but for meat they were also used abundantly as, as sacrifice. And there's a whole connotation there if you want to take it to that, to that level. But Luke talks about, indeed, the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Don't be afraid. You are worth more than many sparrows. We're talking about the value of man to God. If God didn't value us, if he didn't love us, he wouldn't have sent the good shepherd, would he? He would have just let us be in the lost flock. And so in biblical times, it's not just sheep that are extremely valuable to society. It's man, and we share those similarities. Sheep valuable to the men, we valuable, very valuable to God. A study was done recently, 2008, so it's, it's a decade old or so, out of both Leeds University and Oxford. And what they were looking at is they were addressing this pre preconceived notion that man has an inherent trait that we don't even know about, that we have a flock mentality much like sheep. And I found this interesting, especially to us this morning. And the study actually was able to, uh, what they did is they put over 100 people in a room, a dark room, and it was kind of organized chaos in there. And the people were instructed that they couldn't communicate with each other. There was no communication to be had from, from one person to the next. And so you've got this massive amount of people in this room, but nobody's able to communicate. And then they allowed several, just a few, couple of individuals to actually know where the escapes were, where the exits were. And amid all this chaos, and they put all of these factors into this room and so forth, the, the, the couple of people that they let in 
on the secret to where those exits were. When that started happening, people started following them without communication, without verbal knowledge, without any gestures, but they did. And so they did this over and over and over again to prove the validity of this study. And they found out that we do have, or at least according to this scientific study, a flock mentality. We tend to follow others, especially in a situation in which we are uh, not informed or not aware of our surroundings. And then I had the scripture read this morning because I want to talk about that. We, you know, before we react negatively to that in terms of having a flock mentality of, of wanting to follow or stay together or have others there helping us, let's read what God has to say about that. And we read Ecclesiastes, two are better off than one. Why? because together they can work more effectively. We're hearing that from our maker, our creator, saying don't be alone, don't be isolated. It's okay to have a flock mentality. In fact, it helps because if one falls down, the other can help them up, okay? Two are better than one. I would say a flock is best, right? So why is this perceived so negative to? Why is it so negative in our society? doesn't have to be. God says it's not. Okay? A flock mentality in man keeps us from isolation. If you look throughout the scripture, when does Satan tend to tempt people the most? If you look at the story of Christ, where was he? Alone, isolated, in the desert. You know, one that I didn't think about, but if you go back in Genesis and read the first temptation, Eve, it's, it's interesting to note that Adam wasn't there initially, was he? that Eve was alone. And indeed, there are other stories, other instances of Scripture that you can find where Satan waits to her, isolate. It goes with that mentality. Uh, a sheep, defenseless, unable to defend itself. The only chance of survival they have is to be within the flock. Once they're isolated, they become prey. First Peter tells us the devil is a predator. Be alert and sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. How easy is it for a lion to kill a sheep when they're isolated, when they're on their own? When they say, well, I'm going to do this religion thing by myself. Hear that a lot, don't we, these days? It's kind of the new movement. I'm, I'm going to have a relationship on my own. I don't need other Christians. I don't need anybody to help me with my faith. I'm just going to do me. This, this is personal. And it is personal. It is between you and Christ. You must have a personal relationship. But God has told us over and over again that we need each other as well. This flock mentality is not a negative thing. In fact, it protects us from the ultimate predator there, as you see in 1 Peter. Galatians 6, 1, 2, and I'll apply this. It says, brothers and sisters, if someone in your group does something wrong, you who are spiritual should go to that person and gently make him right again. But be careful, because you might be tempted to sin too. By helping each other with your troubles, you truly obey the law of Christ. I love that scripture. Part of the obedience, part of the faith in Christ, helping each other. How can we do that if we're isolated and alone? How does that scripture work if we choose to be set aside and separate? and all alone. It doesn't. We can't fulfill, as it says in the bottom of that scripture, we can't obey the law of Christ. We can't do it. So why, is, why do we react so negatively? Flock mentality is good for us. We are here together. This is what we need. God created us for this. As a congregation, to come, unite, to be as one. That flock mentality is not a negative thing. It's a godly thing. Sheep are also social and emotional. Not sure if we're totally aware of that or not, but they have a highly evolved emotional, mental, cognitive ability. They, in fact, feel every single emotion, I found out, that we do. They build relationships within that flock, and they need to be it's an inherent 
feeling, a need to be with the flock. And I believe God instilled that in us as well. Sheep experience great stress and depression when separated from the flock. Man, too. And they have the cognitive ability to recognize the face and the voice of numerous people. Studies have shown, that, and they've done laboratory studies, up to 50 sheep can memorize and know for several years even the face of up to 50 people, and it might be a year later and that person comes in and they can recognize them. So that, that stereotype that sheep are one of the most unintelligent creatures that God created, I don't buy that. I don't buy it for one minute. And then, of course, you get into what is intelligence. But uh, very, very similar there. And then, of course, one of my favorite scriptures, John, the whole chapter of John 10, talking about Jesus, the good shepherd. Listen to his words. My sheep. Rejoice in that. What a wonder it is to be one of Jesus' sheep. My sheep bought and paid for they hear my voice and this is my favorite part and I know them think about the judgment day think about when Jesus comes what is he's gonna do he's gonna gather his sheep his sheep because he knows them and what what's our end of the bargain we follow him amazing scripture there and see how that works in and ties in and then the last thing that I want to talk about in terms of characteristics I am absolutely amazed at the vision of sheep I did not know this until I started researching this but they have actually almost a 360 degree peripheral vision you know why because their eyes are so far back on their heads. They're actually on the side. And they say they can estimate, through studying, somewhere between 330 to 360, which would be full vision. Behind them, to the side of them, in front of them. That's amazing. Humans, on the other hand, in comparison, we've got about 150 degrees. And a lot of times that's limited because we choose to wear blinders on a lot of things, don't we? <laughs> So, so that was very interesting. And you think about it, the eyes seeing things is one of the few defense mechanisms that this animal actually has to be able to see the predators, to be able to see what's going on behind them, be able to early detection of a threat or danger. You know what the problem with sheep is, though? They have this wonderful ability. They rarely use it. Why? Because they're in that flock right looking straight ahead and following anything that moves is that not like man we too have an unbelievable god created sense of vision look at some of these and i didn't put them all on there it would take too long we'd be here all day all day long if i were to list out all the unbelievable characteristics of the human eye you know charles darwin when he was presenting, you know, his theory of evolution and so forth, the one thing that he talks about that trips him up, that is, is fallible in that theory, is the human eye. He can't explain it. He can't explain it because for the human eye to work, all the parts have to be there. And they all have to work together. And so a, a theory of evolving over time just doesn't hold water when you're, saying, when you're talking about the human eye. Animals would not have been able to see. The eye would not work until it was completely 100% created. Your vision is responsible for 90% of all your knowledge gained. And at first I was like, well, let's apply that to Scripture, but are we not having to look at that Scripture as we read? The muscles in your eye are the most active muscles in your body. Even when you sleep, they're still working. And you get into all the REM cycles and all that's just amazing. Each eye is composed of over 130 million light-sensitive cells. You know, man has tried and failed miserably at trying to 
recreate the human eye. You just can't do it. Man cannot do it. We don't have the knowledge, the intelligence, and we don't like to admit it, but we can't reproduce. We can't, uh, you know, be able to build a robotic human eye. It's just not possible. And a human eye has over two million parts. Just absolutely amazing. All glory be to our Creator on that one. All glory be to Him for creating that. But yet, as sheep, we don't always use that wonderful gift, do we? A lot of times we got our head down and we're just plowing along. I am number one guilty of that, I'll promise you. And in our discussion in class this morning when we were talking about the lost souls, even in our society here in Jim Ned, and I got my head down and I'm not even looking. And that's a problem that I need to fix. But I think it's a problem we all have in our lives. Matthew 6, 22, 23. The Lord says the eye is the lamp of the body. Depending on which translation you're using, there's other words to describe that. If your eyes are healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eyes are unhealthy, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light within you is darkness, oh, how great is that darkness. I learned some new vernacular researching this. I want to see if you're familiar with this term. You ever heard the term sheeple? It's simply formed, right? They just took the word sheep and people and put it together. It is definitely not a positive term in today's society. Sheeple refers to men and women who act like sheep in terms of they're just going to follow whatever is said. Now, in some circles, it means, oh, I'm going to do whatever the government tells me, whatever the healthcare industry tells me, and that's come to light through the pandemic. Oh, those people are sheeple. They just blindly follow whoever says anything. But unfortunately, Christians in today's secular society are certainly referred to as sheeple. There are all kinds of studies out there. I mean, you can... You can Google and you're going to get a million different studies. I just picked a, a meta-analysis from 2013 that actually wanted to, to uh, study the relationship between intelligence and religious behavior. And listen to what they say between IQ, the link or correlation between IQ and religious beliefs. And then I want you to think if that applies. Intelligent people, they say are generally more analytic and data-driven. Okay, I'm, I'm good with that so far. And formal religions are the antithesis. Smarter people tend to be less gullible and don't easily conform. So more intelligent, smarter, more intellectual people are not going to be gullible and overtaken by religion, Christianity, God's Word. That's what that study is telling us. From the secular world. See, their reaction to Christianity is skepticism, intolerance. They see it as a herd mentality, a flock mentality. You, you people don't think for yourself. If you thought for yourself and really rationally looked at things, you would let science prove to you there is no God. That's what true intelligent people will figure out on their own. See, only human rationalism and intellect can keep you from becoming one of those sheep that blindly follows the Word of God. Hmm. That's the message out there, folks, to the next generation of Americans, our children. What does God have to say about that? Here's the focal this morning. If you don't get anything else, I want you to pay attention to these scriptures and understand what God has to say about this particular school of thought. First, it's Paul and Corinthians. For since in the wisdom of God, so right now we're going to compare the wisdom of our almighty creator to the wisdom of man when he says the world through its wisdom. God with his wisdom, the world with their wisdom. And when using their wisdom, he says, the world does not know him. God was pleased 
through the, and it, here he's being facetious, the foolishness of what the world would say is God's word, preached to save those who believe. And that's how they look at it. Those who don't know Christ look at what we believe, what we're seeing in the scriptures, and they see it as foolishness. Paul says God is pleased by that. Because he's not going to allow anyone. And really, if you think about it, you can't find, truly find God through your wisdom. We're not smart enough. We didn't create this world. We don't know all the secrets. God says he keeps that wisdom from us. You can't be saved through your intellect. And if you believe the story of God is just foolishness. That God would, would lower himself to come down here and be amongst the sheep and then voluntarily, willingly get on the cruel tree of the Romans and be sacrificed only to rise three days later and then ascend into heaven 40 days later. Then, then it's just you're a sheep. You're a sheeple. It's foolishness. God delights in that because he knows that those people using human intellect, you can't find him. You can't find God there. It goes on. For the message of the cross is foolishness not to us, but to those who are perishing. Rejoice in that. We're not perishing, we're living. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. It's two schools of thought. Depends on which side you're on, whether you are sheep or a goat. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise. Those who think they're wise down here. Those who sit around and contemplate with their almighty intellect and think through and rationalize that none of this can be true. It's not rational. I will destroy that wisdom. The intelligence of the intelligent, I will frustrate. Where is the wise person? Where is the teacher of the law? Where is the philosopher of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? Amen. Thank you, Lord. Unbelievable. Humanity has failed to come to know God because it goes about it the wrong way. We try to achieve it through human wisdom. In Romans chapter 1, since what may be known about God is plain to them, because God has made it plain to them, for since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, that which man can't find, his, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen being understood from what has been made so that people are without excuse. So in the same token of saying that man can't find God with his own rational, he does say, however, that I have put into this world things that will make you understand and know that God exists and you are not without excuse. You can't come to the judgment day and say, well, I didn't know. No, it's clear in Romans, there's no excuse. The problem is we, we look at this and say, it just, it just can't be this simple. It can't, it, it's too simplistic. We need something, why would, you know, if, if God's going to come down to this earth, shouldn't he be a king and shouldn't he be in a palace and shouldn't he have an army and shouldn't he fight glorious battles and lead us to victory? It can't be that he came down and was a carpenter and a shepherd that he calls himself. And then he died on a cross. It's too simplistic. And indeed, that's what man thinks. It sounds too foolish to a lot of the world. The point is, the human wisdom, knowledge, and logic cannot bring someone to Christ. You just can't do it. You can think all you want. You can theorize all you want. But you're just a sheep. 
and we have to rejoice in that. We can't find God with this brain that we're given. We need the Word of God. We need to let Him lead us through that gate. Allow Him to be our Good Shepherd, to follow Him. We can't do it on our own. Therefore, Jesus said again, John, Very truly I tell you, I'm the gate for the sheep. All who have come before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep have not listened to them. I am the gate. Whoever enters in through me will be saved. They will come and go out and find pasture. That's our calling. The good shepherd has come. He has opened the life gate. We put him on in baptism. We sacrifice ourselves to him. And he will show us the way. The sheep will find their green pastures by still waters. You can't find it on your own. So the ultimate question is, are you going to be a sheep or are you going to be a goat? Again, Paul and Corinthians, for the foolishness of God is wiser than human wisdom. Love that. about to do a drop the mic moment. I'm about to make a statement up here. And I want you to truly give it a second to sink in before you react, okay? Heaven, as we know it, will not be full of good people. Think about that. We can't buy our way in, think our way in, work our way in, sacrifice our way in. We just can't do it. But the world and many say, how how can you keep this person from entering through the gate to heaven? They are so good-hearted. They've done so many good things, they wouldn't hurt a fly. The answer is sin. We're all sinful. Heaven will not be full of good people. Heaven's going to be full of forgiven people. Remember the scripture where God said, only Jesus says, only God is good. Heaven will not be full of good people. Heaven will be full of forgiven people. His sheep who know him, who know his voice, and will follow him. So I say to you this morning, I'm going to flip it around from last week. In a world full of goats, headed the wrong direction, through their own thinking, their own rational, trying to find the purpose in this life, they will not find it. Be one of Christ's sheep. Get rid of our pride, our hubris. Get rid of the need that the world tells you to be something strong and mighty and be the last. Be the low, for the last will be first. And the good shepherd will come to lead us. If you have a need, if you want to become one of Christ's sheep this morning, if you want to put him on in baptism, Acts 2.38, please 